coaching fight here guys stays with me shalom and in today's class we're going to be talking about the rapture okay and what i plan to do is touch on everything rapture including what when how where and who of the rapture but this class will particularly be about the importance of passover and the rapture so we're in the season of passover so what we're doing is producing a lot of classes for you know a lot of people who are new in celebrating the passover this year so this is um be a lot of vital information for them and not only is it our intent to put out a lot of classes but it seems to be our father's intent as well as he is downloading a lot of information to us related to the passover including the new verses that he brought to our attention and how it's related to the rapture. So this class is not only for the new people, but it's for those who have previously celebrated as well. A lot of more information uh, to help them. Yeah, and it's for anybody who plans to get caught away in the rapture. Okay. This is a rapture class. We're going to talk a lot about Passover, but it's primarily a rapture class. Like I said, we want to talk or touch on the who, the what, the when, the where, and even the how of the rapture. All right. So we'll start off talking more about the rapture, but then towards the middle of the video, we're going to get into its relationship to Passover and Passover's relationship to the rapture. And then towards the end of the video, we're going to tell you when the rapture is going to be. Okay, this should be interesting. Should be very interesting. So, first thing we want to do is we want to jump over here and we want to define what we're talking about when we say rapture. Okay. Because, as we know, there are several definitions to the word rapture. There's a lot of people out there who talk on the rapture and speak on the rapture. Some use the word rapture and some don't use that word at all. They use other words like great awakening or third temple or the hour of the conscious and other things while other people use the word rapture but I believe we're actually talking about the same thing mm -hmm. matter of fact I believe when we come over and look at the definition of the word rapture from the Merriam-Webster dictionary we see proof of that as this word has three definitions to it okay if you would go ahead and read the first definition definition of Rapture, number one, an expression or manifestation of ecstasy or passion. Now, this is the word that you'll find in your old dictionaries. If you find a dictionary that's 100 years old, 200 years old, you'll find this definition as well as the second definition. Go ahead and read that one. A state or experience of being carried away by overwhelming emotion. Now, you see how closely those two are related? Yes. We actually did a class on it not too long ago looking at the differences in these two definitions. But if you will, go ahead and read part B of definition two. A mystical experience in which the spirit is exalted to a knowledge of divine things. So all of these are definitions of the word rapture. So when you hear people say the word rapture, they could be pointing to one of these two definitions, but they could also be talking about number three. Read that. Often capitalized the final assumption of Christians into heaven during the end time according to Christian theology. So there you have two or three different definitions of the word rapture. But like I said, I believe all of these events will take place. And I believe all of these are actually true. I believe all of these make up the rapture. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what your individual destination is. For instance, a lot of people will be called away in number three, which will be an assumption into heaven or into the spirit world. But then those that are not taken away in that manner, a lot of them will be in the definition number one and number two, where they will have this spiritual awakening, this great awakening. Here is the only time we can really touch on how the rapture will take place because there's no way for us to know who's going to go on which path. Right. It depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. And that's the same as it goes for the where. There's no way you can say where you're going to end up 
I mean, those who are sure that they are going to fly away in the rapture are sure that they are going to end up in heaven. But this class is for everybody. So there's no real way that we could say where any individual would end up. Mm -hmm. Some will experience this rapture here on earth. Right. While others will be in the spirit world. Right. So let's get a little bit into what actually is the rapture. Okay. For that, we're going to go to a few verses where we hear about the rapture. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, now this is one of the first places, one of the main verses that we hear when anybody talks about the rapture. Now, there's some key words that we need to pull out here to get our understanding. One is how it's talking about this archangel here. Mm -hmm. the another is how it's talking about this trump of God here. Right. And then it goes on to talk about the dead in Christ rising. Okay. Let's go on to the next verse. Not surprising, it's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So here we're hearing how we're going to be changed, and here again we're hearing how the dead is going to be raised. We're, we're also seeing that the trumpet will sound, like we saw in 1 Thessalonians. And we also see how it's saying the same thing as we saw in 1 Thessalonians as far as the trump of God, where it says, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Right. Now, let's go on to Matthew chapter 24, which you don't hear about so much, but is actually talking about the same thing. Verse 31 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, again, we're seeing this trumpet. Right. And so we're seeing a pattern here with the sound of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing a pattern here when it's talking about his angels. Yes. So it's clear that this is talking about the same event. Right. But now let's look at some other information that's given here. This is the Messiah talking. But notice how he says, they shall gather together his elect mm -hmm. from the four winds. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And we'll come back to Matthew chapter 24 when we start talking about when is the rapture. But now let's talk about these parts here where it's talking about the trumpet, the gathering together of the elect from the four winds. And this angel here. Okay. Which one do you think we ought to touch on first? Um, let's start with the angels, since it's, it's first. All right, cool. Let's go down to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. If you would, read that. And at that time shall Daniel stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So here we are hearing about how these people are delivered. And we're hearing about the archangel Michael. But is it clear that it is connected to the verses we saw previously? Uh, I'm having a little problem seeing that it is. Well, let's look at the next verse in Daniel chapter 12. If you would, read verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, see how you see in there that the dead in Christ will rise? Right. That's so, again, you're hearing about the archangel. Mm -hmm. You're saying that the people are delivered, and you're saying that the dead in Christ will rise. Right. So I believe we can understand that Daniel chapter 12 is also talking about this rapture event. Right. And even further down in Daniel chapter 12, he actually tells us when this will take place. But we'll get back to that towards the end of the video when we talk about the end. And before we move on, let's look at Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. Behold, 
I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So here it is again that we're hearing about this angel. Now, for some, it may be hard to make the connection on who Elijah is in relationship to Michael in chapter 4. But when you come back to chapter 3, you get a better idea who it's talking about when it says the angel or the messenger of the covenant. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about the same archangel that is to come. Well, if you look back over at chapter 4 and verse 6, that you can see that he is too regathering our father's people. If you will, go ahead and read verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I believe what it's talking about is our hearts will be turned back to him. Okay. But anyway, I think it's clear this archangel is going to play a key role in the rapture. So let's go on to talk about the trumpet. Now, I searched all through the scripture trying to find out what this trumpet was. And in the King James Version of the Bible, it never talks about the trump of God and what it actually is. At one point, I thought it was connected to the trumpets that we hear about in Revelation chapter 8. But I give praise to our Father after a lot of prayer, meditation, and even conversation with some of the people down in the comment section of the video I went in and started searching the third testament of the Bible for what this trumpet is. And I believe it actually tells us what the trumpet is that we're hearing about in the third testament of the Bible. Okay. Now we're down here in chapter 55 of the third testament of the Bible, which talks about the purification of the world and humanity and the judgment. So it goes over a lot of the apocalyptical stuff, but... If you would, drop down to verse 96 for us. The last whirlwinds and the last battles with their quotas of bitterness are yet to come. It is necessary yet for all the forces to agitate and the atoms to spin in chaos so that afterwards there can come the lethargy, the fatigue, the sadness, and the weariness that seem like death. So here we need to try to remember this verse when we're talking about the timing of the rapture. Mm -hmm. So we'll try to come back to this when we get into that part. But let's look at verse 97. And that will be the hour when, in the solemnity of the conscious, the vibrating echo of a trumpet will be heard, announcing from the beyond that the kingdom of life and peace comes to the men of goodwill. So, ta-da, there you have it. huh? Right. Mm -hmm. It's telling us what the trumpet is. The vibrating echo of the trumpet will be heard, announcing from the beyond. Right, and this, um, from my understanding, takes place within the conscious. Yeah, that's what it says there, the sublimity of the conscious. When in the sublimity of the conscious, so it's telling us that this trumpet will be heard in the conscious. Mm -hmm. And just for those who are aware of the Third Testament and want to study on this further, this is the only time that the word trumpet is being used. But if you want to do further study, study the word vibrate or vibrating. Because when you look that word up in the Third Testament, it's talking about the same thing. But it gives a lot more verses and a lot more detail on this event that's being talked about here. The vibrating echo of the trumpet will be heard. And what does it say? Announcing from the beyond, which is talking about the spirit world, that the kingdom of life and peace comes to men of goodwill. Yeah, that definitely supports, um, when we go back to the definition of one and two, um, it definitely supports that. What do you mean? Um, the manifestation of ecstasy or passion, which we know is just that feeling um, of um, like an overwhelming feeling of um, joy. Yeah, yeah, joy, passion, excitement, yeah, yeah excitement. Um, and two goes on to say that overwhel overwhelming emotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it also talks about what Daniel is talking about there in chapter 12, if you would read verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. 
Alright? So now let's come back over to the third testament. Let's look at verse 98. And before the voice of that trumpet, the dead in spirit will rise weeping tears of repentance. And the father shall receive them like prodigal sons worn out from the long journey and fatigued from this great struggle and seal their spirits, bestowing upon them the kiss of love. So here it is that we're learning about the dead in Christ. Right. See, it's saying here that the dead in spirit. So it's talking about us who most of which don't even know that we have a spirit right. because of our materialism and our disobedience and a lot of the pharmacia of the world are shutting down our spirit and not allowing it to play a part in our lives now. Mm -hmm. Well, we see here that that's going to change. Right. And we see here that the dead in spirit rise before the voice of the trumpet. Right. Well, that's exactly what First Thessalonians is saying over there when it says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Right. Mm -hmm. The dead in Christ rise before we hear the trumpet sound. Right, before um, we hear that echoing trumpet within our conscience. And again, that points to the timing of this all, which we'll get to later. But this is the same thing that said over in the book of Malachi in chapter 5. When he's talking about before the great and dreadful day, the people start to be regathered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it should be really clear here that if we could somehow take all of these verses that are clearly talking about the same event and put them in a pot and stir them up real good and add the heat that we only get from divine inspiration, we can see that this is telling us what the rapture is. Right. Mm hmm we want to touch on a few verses that talk on the general timing of the rapture before we go on to the specific timing of the rapture. All right. And one verse that we'll pull out first is Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 8, coming from the Septuagint translation. Okay. Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of the Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return hither. So here we are again talking about the regathering right. that we heard about over in Matthew chapter 24. But notice how it's saying at the feast of the Passover. Mm -hmm. Now look at verse 7 right quick. For thus says the Lord of Jacob, Rejoice ye, and exult over the head of the nations. Make proclamation, and praise ye. Say, the Lord has delivered his people, the remnant of Israel. So again, it's talking about delivering of the people. Mm -hmm. And we heard that in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Mm -hmm. But what we want to bring out here is how he's talking about the feast of Passover. Yeah. We can see this reaffirmed over in the book called Second Esdras. And we're down here in chapter 2 of Second Esdras. If you would, read verse 38. Arise up and stand. Behold the number of those that be sealed in the feast of the Lord. So here it's talking about the sealing during the feast of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You see in verse 40 down there is talking about take thy number. Yeah. Talking about the number of people that will be sealed during the feast of the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you would read that. Take thy number, O Zion, and shut up those of thine that are clothed in white which have fulfilled the law of the Lord. Notice here how it's saying that they clothed in white. Right. And I know I'm jumping around, but even verse 38 talks about these garments, if you would read that. Which are departed from the shadow of the world and have received glorious garments of the Lord. So again, it's talking about these garments here. So we'll remember these phrases that he's talking about, these glorious white garments here. Right. And how they are sealed in the feast of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And let's take all of this information when we go over and we look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here we are again talking about these robes here. So what we're doing is going from uh, scripture to scripture, precept to precept, uh, making the case for Passover, right? 
We're almost to that point. In fact, this verse even talks about it when it says that these garments that we're hearing about that are to be washed are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Right. And what we're going to find out here shortly is that that occurs at the Feast of Passover. But before we jump in there, let's look at these verses a little bit closer. Like, for instance, verse 13, how it's talking about these white robes. So we're finding out that these robes become white only when they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let me bring you back over to another place that talks about this. And that's down here in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 11. Binding up his foal unto the vine and his ass's coat unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So this is talking about the same thing. Right. But notice in verse 10 that it's talking about how he shall be gathered. Mm -hmm. The gathering of his people. So we're seeing this commonly used is that this gathering is taking place during or because of the washing of these garments in the blood of the grapes mm -hmm. or in the wine. Right. This is the prophecy for Judah. And so what we're learning here is that those whose garments will be washed in the blood of the grapes or in the blood of the lamb are who we would refer to as the spiritual Judah. So it's clear that what Israel was talking about is how Judah would be those who wash their garments in this wine. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, let's go over to the book of Matthew. Because it's starting to become clear with these verses, the connection between the regathering and the Passover. So let's look in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So here it is that we're seeing what goes on with the wine at Passover. Mm -hmm. The Passover wine is actually purifying us of our sins the same way they did in Moses' time with the blood of the lambs. Mm -hmm. They threw that blood all over the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Well, in this era, we don't use the blood of lambs. In its place, we have the blood of the Messiah, and it comes in the form of the Passover wine. Right. We see here what it's talking about. When the other scriptures said that their garments were washed in the blood, mm -hmm. he's talking about our spiritual temple being cleansed during the Passover celebration. Mm -hmm. And let's come over to the book of the epistle of Barnabas and let's see what this does for us. If you would look at verse 21. Having received remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord, we are become renewed. Being again created, it were, from the beginning. Wherefore, God truly dwells in our house that is in us. So here it is. It's talking about how the remission of the sins makes us renewed as we were in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Talking about the days of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. So just like they were able to have communion with the Father anytime they wanted. Once we get the remission of our sins, we go back to that state. Right. And then that's when it starts talking about God truly dwells in his house. It's talking about our spiritual temples here. Right. And all this happens when we partake of the Passover. This is what happens when we partake of the Passover. In fact, let's come over to the book of John and chapter 6 where the Messiah expounds on this a little bit. If you would, start reading at verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, we hear this all the time where it's talking about he who believes on the Father has everlasting life. Mm -hmm. But what does that actually mean? Well, for many, it means that you will live forever. But look at verse 48. I am the bread of life. So he's saying in verse 47 that you believe on me. And then in verse 48, he defines who me is, and that is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Go on to 49. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, 
that a man may eat thereof and not die. So again, he's talking about him and this bread of life and how by, by partaking in this bread, you will not die. Mm -hmm. So again, he's talking about Passover, which includes not only the wine, but the bread. But go on to verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So he's defining what it means to believe on him. Right. His consumption of this bread, which we know as the word of God. Mm -hmm. In verse 52, we hear on how the Jews are starting to fight amongst themselves. But if you would, read verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So, again, we started off talking about believing in him and having everlasting life. But now he's saying, now he's adding caveats to it. They're saying what? Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have this everlasting life. Right. So, believing on him means eating the flesh and the blood. Mm-hmm. Read verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So here we are again hearing about this raising of the spiritually dead or the dead in Christ. Yeah. So again, it's making the connection between all of the verses that we've heard here. Mm -hmm. And it's talking about how we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have this everlasting life and in order to be raised. Mm -hmm. So if you would go on to verse 55, 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, that's what we heard over there in the epistle of Barnabas, right? Mm -hmm. Once we... Yeah, once we partake of him and receive remission of our sins, then we will become renewed and become a part of him. And then he'll dwell in our house. Yes. That's exactly what verse 56 is saying. Go on to 57. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father... So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Well, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, these people are like, what is, is he, what, is he telling us to eat him? Do yeah, they had, a, they had a problem with that. Um, you see, that's what the Jews were fighting about back up there in a few verses. They yeah, were, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they thought. Oh, matter of fact, read verse 52 that we skipped. And the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Yeah, so, yeah, a lot of people got confused, and, you know, even in the Roman Catholic Church, they got confused as well. It was one of the arguments they used to try to get rid of the whole Passover celebration, because they said these people were down there eating blood and, mm -hmm. and stuff. But anyway, look at verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So here is this eternal life that we are supposed to receive mm -hmm. by way of the rapture. We see that we actually get this by partaking in the Passover celebration. Yeah, I think it's, you know, kind of clear to see from my point of view that he's definitely um, referring to the feast of the Passover. Now let's come back over to Matthew chapter 26. Let's read verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here it is, again, talking about the timing of all of this. Mm -hmm. Because he says that there's coming a day when he's actually going to drink it with us. Right. you got to remember that he was a Nazarite. Mm -hmm. And so he had taken that vow not to eat anything of the grape. But this is talking about that marriage supper. Mm -hmm. That he is actually going to eat with us. Right. When we are in the Father's kingdom. Absolutely. So let's get into the timing of this. When is this event going to take place? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of elements here. And we're kind of juggling these. Maybe even fumbling a few of them. Because you have the trumpet. You have the raising of the dead. You have the regathering of the people. You have the remission of the sins and the building of the spiritual temple, our fleshly temple. 
and you have the washing of the garments. So that's a bunch of stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. And maybe we have to spend some time actually sorting out when each thing will happen specifically. But let's just speak in general here as we come back over to the Third Testament and chapter 55 and look at verse 96 again. The last whirlwinds and the last battles with their quotas of bitterness are yet to come. It is necessary yet for all the forces to agitate and the atoms to spin in chaos so that afterwards there can come the lethargy, the fatigue, the sadness, and the weariness that seem like death. So here it is, it's talking about events that must take place before we hear about this vibrating echo of the trumpet we see in 97. Mm -hmm. So this is pointing to the timing of it. Mm -hmm. Now, let's come back over to Matthew chapter 24 because it gets into the timing as well. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So, the trumpet, the gathering, the angel, all talking about the same event, but look back up in verse 29 and we can start to see when this is to take place. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So let us be real careful here, because like we said, there's a lot of events that are to take place here, but... It's saying specifically in 29 and 30 that all of these events are to take place before the great sound of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. And that's supported over in the third testament of the Bible where it talks about all of these events in 96 that are to take place before the vibrating echo of the trumpet in 97. And there's another verse that we'll touch on as far as the timing and that's over here in the epistle of the apostles where the Messiah is giving his disciples specifics on the timing. You see in verse 17 that the, the apostles are asking him for the timing of some of these events. If you would, read verse 17. We said unto him, Lord, after how many years shall this come to pass? He said unto us, When the hundredth part and the twentieth part is fulfilled, between the Pentecost and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then shall the coming of the Father be. So it's pointing to the specifics of the timing. And it's talking about Pentecost and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But if you look at the Coptic translation that starts halfway through that verse, it talks about Passover. If you would, start reading in the parentheses. When in hundred and fifty years are passed, in the days of the Feast of Passover and Pentecost... So it's talking specifically about Passover and Pentecost here. And then in the Ethiopian, it says something a little different. Look at it. Between the unleavened bread and Pentecost shall be the coming of my father. So here, I believe the focus is not really on the festival in which he is coming. He's talking more about the 120th Jubilee there. I believe that's what this verse is about, is that he's talking about the 120th Jubilee. And we can factor this into the timing of all of this in order to know what year he's talking about. But what I want to bring out here is how he's talking about the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost mm -hmm. and how these events would take place between those two festivals. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like a person will partake in the Feast of Passover with the bread and the wine and then they will go through the Feast of Unleavened Bread which is all about the Word of God and getting in connection with his scripture where they will learn what he expects of him and how to walk according to his will and then sometime between the Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost we can expect this manifestation of ecstasy that we heard about this overwhelming emotion that we heard about, even this exaltation of divine things that we heard about. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe even the final assumption of Christians into heaven. Okay. Especially if this happens really close to the day of the Lord. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I'm just thinking how it's more so of a spiritual thing than um, anything else. Well, it will be physical, especially for those who find themselves in the spirit world. Right. It don't get much more physical than that. Yeah. But for those who will remain here on the earth, those that will be left behind, so to speak, it will be all of a spiritual thing. Yes. So, there you have it. The who, what, when, where, and how. Of the rapture and its relationship to Passover. Yeah, it's... um. A lot of um, new things were brought out, and um, all of them, all the events seem to point out to, um, yeah, the Feast of Passover. And, you know, you think back in how it worked in the last time that we saw these catastrophic earthly events take place, which was back there in Egypt, and how their escape from those events were centered around the Feast of Passover. Mm -hmm. It's like Passover was an absolute necessary requirement for them to escape altogether. Mm -hmm. Those that didn't partake in the Passover didn't escape. No, they died. At least the firstborn males died. So Passover is extremely significant when it talks about the escape. Yeah. And while we're talking about the escape, Let's, let's remind ourselves that being removed from the planet is not the only way that our Father brings people through tribulations. Okay. You remember Noah, he was actually on an ark while the rest of humanity was perishing by way of a flood. Noah was on this ark. Could you imagine how boring it was on that ark? Very lonely. Very lonely, very boring, while the rest of the world was in complete chaos. It was like Noah really didn't see much of what was going on. He was actually in a state of escape. Yeah, unless he uh, looked his head over that rail and saw those dead bodies floating up there. Uh, I don't know, maybe he knew he was in a better place. Yeah. So. And, and then when you think about Lot, and before that fire and brimstone came out of the heavens how the archangels came and carried him out of Gomorrah mm -hmm. and escape, yeah, he to escaped. his escape. And yeah. so there he was while the city was being completely destroyed. Him and his daughters were there by themselves. Thinking that, well, his daughters uh, for sure were thinking that they were the only people left um, on the land, on yeah. the earth. Mm -hmm. so, being supernaturally removed is not the only escape whatsoever. It's just the most popular. It's definitely the most popular, <laughs> but it is not the only. And so with that, I believe we're going to go ahead and close this video out. Okay. I think we have um, given everybody a, definitely a lot of scriptures to, to look out and study and to meditate on. And um, I hope that we showed them that, you know, how... Just one of the, uh, well, another reason that the Passover is so important. Yeah, that's what they should have got out of this video, is how important the Passover celebration is. And just to remind everybody, the Passover celebration for the year 2021 will start on the evening of April the 26th and will last until the evening of April the 27th. Mm -hmm. But if you're watching this video after April the 26th, don't forget about second Passover. Right. We hear about that over in Numbers chapter 9. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how important it is. Mm -hmm. He's very much so looking out for us and giving us this second chance. So we don't have much of an excuse for missing Passover, but I don't think we really want an excuse for missing Passover, understanding how important it is for our salvation. Right. Mm -hmm. Passover is necessary for our salvation. Yes. So. We've taken up a lot of you guys' time. We appreciate you staying with us. If you would, go ahead and leave us a comment and hit that like button. Mm -hmm. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.